In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You know, this gospel today reminds me of watching the back and forth of a ping pong match. Call up Matthew, did it with the undesirables, kicked off Pharisees, dead child, ill woman. Where do you look first? <laughs> There's so much here. Mm. There are several good sermon themes here, and it was hard to choose just one. But I chose the theme of healing. Each of these little vignettes highlight healing. For Matthew, it was the healing of a lifestyle. As a tax collector, his life was built on the betrayal of his own people. You see, the Romans hired Jews to collect taxes because they thought that other Jews would be less likely to rebel if they were dealing with a Jewish tax collector. But the Romans did not pay these tax collectors, oh no. They had to shake down their fellow Jews for extra coin to pay themselves. So you've paid, come on, a little, little bit more. And if people did not pay or could not pay, the tax collector had the authority to take some property some of their crops, maybe their milk cow, and even to the taking of children and selling them into slavery so they could get paid. Matthew had a lot of healing to do, but to start that healing, Matthew had to take action. The action took, he took was to follow Jesus. I doubt very much he knew what he was getting into, <laughs> but he did follow. Dinner with the undesirables, had a large measure of healing to it, too. These undesirables were tax collectors, thieves, prostitutes, the poor, the mentally ill. All of these were to be avoided so as not to make the upright people unclean. These people were to be avoided at all cost. They were not even seen. In dining with them, Jesus was lending some social and emotional healing to them. He was legitimizing them as the beloved of God as well. You know, I see this in the homeless ministry all the time. In addition to the poor, the homeless also include gang members, the mentally ill, thieves, and other criminals. And no one sees them. I mean, we cross the street when we see one ahead of us, or we look the other way, and who of us has not done that? I have. Many are overwhelmed by their lives of poverty and poor choices but they just want to be treated like a human being as any of us would want to be treated. And then we have the ticked off Pharisees. It's not hard to find them, they're all over the place. <laughs> to them, eating and giving these desirables, any re undesirables, any respect was what they could not tolerate. They were rejecting the evidence of healing that Jesus was offering to the undesirables. They chose not to engage with it. They chose not to take any action that might help them heal from their arrogance. And then, of course, there was Jairus. He sought out Jesus and asked in faith. All of these episodes indicate for us that we are to be co-agents in our own healing. God will help, but we cannot pray, God, heal me from this, and then continue with our own poor choices. God will do only so much. It is our gift of free will to make changes that finally affect God's healing grace. And if you excuse me for a minute, I'm still trying to wash Canada out of my throat. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I was listening to a news broadcast about one of the recent mass shootings in Texas. A reporter was interviewing, I think it was a state senator, and asked about steps to be taken to limit access to assault weapons. The response went something like this. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. We will pray for better outcomes in the future. <laughs> but the reporter challenged that by asking what concrete steps would be taken to protect children and got the same answer. That answer was like saying, I will ask God to fix this while I'm still providing assault weapons to the people who might use them on children. That's exactly what that answer said. This person was not a co-agent in healing with God. He was throwing his own desires in front of God, blocking the path to healing. This man understood neither prayer nor healing, and this is sad. Until we understand these things, nothing will improve. 
But with all these episodes in the gospel tied together, what kept coming back to me were two things, the chronically ill woman and what must have been Jairus' emotional response to the delay in attending his child. With the desperation that Jairus must have felt about his daughter's condition, we can only imagine how relieved he must have felt when the teacher said that he would come and attend to her. This was Jairus' last hope to save her life. And then, a delay. An ill woman. Not dying, mind you, but just ill. Couldn't Jesus have let her have the healing and then move on to the more urgent case? Mm -mm. Jesus did not operate like that. Jairus must have been ready to scream. You see, it would not be vintage Jesus to just walk away from a woman in need. He always healed completely when he healed, and to walk away from the now physically healed woman would have done her a grave disservice that would leave her only partially healed. No, he must heal her completely. But why? She, she wanted physical healing, and it seems she'd gotten it with a simple touch of his garment. But all was not quite as simple as it seemed. You see, when a woman had such a flow, she was considered unclean. It was believed that, that with one touch, she could kill fruit-bearing trees. The olives, the oranges, which Israel was known for, would have fallen off the trees and rot. They believed she could turn wine sour, <coughs> dull the edge of steel weapons, kill hives of bees, and could even make bronze and iron rust. A woman in this condition, they believed, could drive dogs mad and infect their, blood, their bite with incurable disease. So women during these moments were pariahs. They had to stay away from family, were not welcome in synagogue or temple. They had to isolate themselves. Imagine how hard then for this woman, having suffered this for 12 years. She was desperate. <coughs> she had tried everything. She spent all her money on cures that did not work. Some of the more common cures for this at the time, according to Pliny's natural history, would have been to consume a drink made from powdered horse's teeth mixed with alum, or to consume burned mice skulls, among other things. <clears throat> it seems she tried it all to no avail. She was desperate. So desperate even that she tried to join a crowd of people hoping that no one would notice the flow and to touch a man's garment in that condition was unforgivable. <clears throat> but why touch the garment? What was so important about fringe? Well, the story goes like this, that God commanded Jewish men to wear fringes on the hems of their garments to remind them of God. It was simply a religious symbol to the observer. As they attached the fringes, they would tie them each with 39 knots, signifying the Hebrew words, the Lord is one. You see, in Hebrew, numbers can indicate letters also. In the book of Malachi, it says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. This Son of Righteousness was the Messiah. The Hebrew word for wings is the same word for hem, and that is where the fringes were attached. By touching the fringes, the woman was not only seeking healing, she was testifying to Jesus as the Messiah. It was a very, very strong visual. So she reached out to him in faith as Messiah. But why did Jesus have to stop and ask about it? I'm sure Jairus was asking himself that question. Because the woman needed to be healed fully. If she was clandestinely healed, no one would know and they would never believe her. So Jesus had to make her healing public so she could be restored to her family and her community. So now her physical and social healing had been taken care of. He only had to address spiritual healing. Jesus clarified with her that it was faith, not fringes, that healed her. The fringes were only a, a touchstone that would release her faith. The only requirement was that she realize that Jesus was the healer and not the fringes that it was her faith that activated the healing and not the fringes. She reached out to him and became a co-agent in her own healing. 
So now that the woman had been completely healed, that left only one task, to heal the child. Jairus' invitation to Jesus to come was what he had had to do to be a co-agent with Jesus in his daughter's healing. This invitation was a faithful gesture that Jesus could answer on his own terms, and he did. Despite what I am sure was Jairus' anxiety at the interruption, Jairus and the, each wo the ill woman each played their parts as co-agents in healing. These two short accounts hold a few things in common. First, that God will heal with his own timing. Then, that God will heal fully, and that we are all to be co-agents in our own healing. The word healing means wholeness. We all have places in our lives where we are not whole where we need God's healing grace. It might be physical, it might be emotional, it might be in a relationship, it could be anything. Consider, please, where you are not whole and seek God to be a co-agent with you in your own healing. May we all understand that we have our own parts to play in our faith and in our healing. Amen. Amen.